others. And there's a wonderful um, African-American writer, Audre Lorde, who's a poet and an essayist. And she always said, your silence will not protect you. Wow. And to me, I've had that those words above my desk for years, and it took me years to understand what she meant. It is still Treza in the afternoon, keeping you company still until 2 o'clock. But right now, we're getting into our woman crush segment for this morning, chatting to internationally acclaimed writer um, that has been described as South Africa's queen of crime. We're chatting to Margie Orford, who is an award-winning journalist and writes regularly about crime, gender-based violence, politics, freedom of expression, and literature. She was awarded a Fulbright scholarship in 1999 and has a master's in comparative literature from the graduate school. School of the City University of New York, born in London, UK, and having spent most of her life in Namibia and South Africa, Margie is an honorary honorary fellow of St. Hugh's College at Oxford, and she is the president emerita of uh, Penn South Africa. Was on the board of Penn International and is a co a co author of the Penn International Women's Manifesto. The one and only Margie Orford joins us in studio today, all the way from London, as she will be launching her memoir love and fury in vinduk this evening good afternoon to you margie and thank you for joining us here in it, 99 it's so nice to be here it's, it's a pleasure to have you in these beautiful like april champagne oh, we don't start. like this weather we don't like it. it's too cold it's too early in the year. it's too early no no, no but I, li- I like it it's so beautiful yeah no we i guess we're gonna have to get used to it either yeah. way so um margie let's let's get to you, you we hear for you right now as an award-winning uh journalist and novelist can you share some pivotal moments um or experiences from your life that have shaped your career and uh, who you have become as a storyteller Well, this book, Love and Fury, which is my memoir, kind of pulls together my adult life, I suppose, from my first baby. I had Mm -hmm. very young, very unplanned, like many women listening, many people, you make a plan around that first surprise baby who's Mm -hmm. completely marvelous and now (laughs) 34 years old, which I find rude having such a grown-up old (laughs) child. Um, And I came back to Namibia in 1990 to live here with that little girl and had some more. And so Namibia really formed my adult career and writing experience. But I suppose one of the things I've I've gone looked at in this memoir, having written six novels before, is how to give an account of a woman's life. Mm. I'm sure anybody listening, you know that you find yourself in the stories of other women, how they've navigated family and career, the frustrations and the pleasures of marriage and of trying to work and trying to balance 400 glass balls, which Mm. you're juggling all the time. Um, And so my writing career really started here with books. I was working with um, with one writer who has remained a friend, a Namibian writer, Ellen Ndeshi Namila. I worked with her on her memoir there, and I remember her saying to me that a woman writing her own story is a political act. Mm. And that really stayed with me. So... After the end of my marriage, all sorts of really difficult things, sort of crises, lots of depression, which I only sort of understood through writing this book, I understood that by writing a story of my own, it's kind of you open up the house of yourself into which you invite other people to inhabit. And the amazing thing is, like, I found myself through other writers, women writers in particular, women singers, women artists, and I think I thought of writing this memoir as that, mm. as a opening up the house to myself where we can find experiences that we share. Yeah. And some of them have startled me. I can imagine. It, really, because they come out and you think, okay, that I can't believe that happened, but it's true. I mean, stories of sexual violence, of overcoming sorts of things, and you kind of just go on when you're young, and then there gets to a point where you have to reckon with and it. And deal with Hence it. Hence the love yeah, and the yeah, fury. And the fury. Yeah. Hello there. <laughs> All right, our second question is about some of the challenges you face and, and how you overcame them, uh, uh, Margie. And just to add to your, to, to, to your previous answer, when you spoke about, you know, allowing people into your home, sometimes the vulnerability, being vulnerable like that, telling your story and having the whole world see it and, and read it, it must be nerve-wracking at, at some point as well. How do you deal with, you know, uh, those challenges uh, and, and how do you face and overcome those challenges? It's a very good question because the writing that I've done, which I started working, a work I was doing from Namibia in the early 90s, 
looking at gender-based violence, violence against women, let's mm. be Specific. clear yes. about what we mean, and violence against girls, and men caught up in a system of patriarchy and of this need to be aggressive to kind of prove themselves. I had this question, why is South Africa and Namibia so violent? So we had war here, we have had independence, we have all sorts of things, but that was the thing that I wanted to understand. One of the things I think that women do, especially rape survivors, is carry the shame of the perpetrator. So the man who does it feels shameless. The survivor carries his shame. And I thought, I reached a point where I thought, no, this is, this is not right. Let's return to sender. Mm. Let's deal with the shame. Often what keeps women quiet is a feeling that something done to them has sh- harmed them and shamed them and they must now carry two burdens the violence done to them and this desire to be silent this requirement and so that's the vulnerability is is actually where you find your strength if your strength is all based on keeping things out if it's based on hardness it will shatter Mm. and in my life that is what happened to me i was very in control nothing ever happened to me i wrote about other people there was a strength but it was a hardness as opposed to an internal strength Mm. like if you think of your arm you've got a bone right you can press quite hard before you push back so i've turned around my idea of what vulnerability is i think you make yourself strong by saying, I'm not carrying the shame of other people. These things happen to me, good things, some really awful things. I've made a story out of it. I'm fine. Not always fine. I'm okay. There's a, mm. there's a strength around not keeping the silence of others. And there's a wonderful um, African-American writer, Audre Lorde, who's a poet and an essayist. And she always said, your silence will not protect you. Wow. And to me, I've had that those words above my desk for years, and it took me years to understand what she meant. Um, and I think what she meant, or how I've taken it in this book, is by saying, if you tell the truth, you say, yes, I was so vulnerable, somebody could have killed me in that circumstance, but that's not my shame. Mm. It's not my story. It's not my story. I, you know, you go through those things and work with them. I've worked a lot with, with rape survivors. I was patron of rape crisis in South Africa for a long time. And I saw with people, they found their own stories, their own lives again, when they could find a way of telling their own stories. And of course, when you do that, you find the difficult things and the pleasurable Delightful trauma. You that returns to you mm. once you get a way of articulating the trauma. So I suppose it was that, and how to be both, how to tell both stories, um, that you can be both successful and a failure. Yeah, at the same time. At the same time. Yeah. Usually at the same. Always <laughs> at the same. Time. At the same time. <laughs> All right, Amari, just because of time, um, I just want to quickly also get into just as a journalist, um, you know, as a novelist who's been writing. You said you have six no- uh, novels under your belt. Uh, you have a memoir that's coming out right now. Uh, if you had any advice that you would like to offer to aspiring journalists and writers who are just starting out in their careers, I think for me personally, what I want to know is how do you deal with writer's block? Like sometimes it happens where you sitting in front of your laptop, you're typing and then you delete and then you type and then you delete. How do you deal with that as well as a writer when you don't have the inspiration to write? What advice do you have for a journalist or a writer? I think with any art form, and writing is an art form, it's like Michelangelo said, 90% application perspiration, 10% inspiration. Okay. Often when you sit in there typing, trying to beat yourself into submission to do things, all you need to do is move your body. Mm. Close your laptop, pick up your notebook, go and sit in the garden, go to a cafe, have a sleep. Don't be that strict. In that just, moment. Yeah, just move yourself out of the thing. Because writing comes from the body. Mm. So often if you're feeling of discomfort, just move it. Move somewhere else. Um, write down everything that you see and especially things that puzzle you, things that are painful. So when I teach writing quite a lot and I just say, write through that block, 
describe the block? Is it wood? Is it metal? Is it a gigantic piece of ice? <laughs> Can you just turn your back on it and write something else? Mm-hmm. You know, we get so locked into this idea of being perfect, I think, especially women, that we keep doing the same thing over and over again. So believe that your story will find its form and listen to your body. Listen to your body. I like that. I think that's the advice there. Listen to your body. Your book is coming out tonight. It's launching tonight. Love and, and Fury. As you mentioned, there is love and there is the fury on this side. And where can we purchase the uh, the memoir? The launch is happening and it makes me so happy to be doing it in my hometown um, at the Goethe Institute. Nice. So the Winter Book Den has all the books in stock, but they're having the, uh, the launch at the Goethe Institute, which I think is just down from the from Zoo Park, yes, yep, yes. above Zoo, Zoo, uh, Zoo Park, Zoo Park, yes, Zoo Gardens, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, and the book is for sale at the Book Den, and at other bookshops, I imagine, would have it as well. And I think we're giving we're giving of- away a book here. Yeah. Yes, we're giving a book uh, away on air. So if you're listening right now and you want to get this book before it actually launches uh, tonight, we are giving away a copy of Margie Orford's uh, memoir titled Love and Fury. Margie, thank you so much. It was an honor to meet you uh, as well. And, and just to hear, even though it wasn't, you know, the full, complete your story, but just to hear why you write and why you do what you do. Uh, you know, I really appreciate you coming to share your story with us. And uh, yeah, hopefully I'll also get a book for myself. Uh, you never know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us here in 99. Okay, thank you for having me. You're so welcome. That's Margie Orford in studio. As I mentioned, I am giving away a copy of her memoir, Love and Fury, on the show. And that was Woman Crush for this uh, afternoon. 99 FM's Woman Crush.